Southwest Airlines. Many of us have flown Southwest for many, many years. Southwest Airlines is so successful in large part because they have a simple, laser-focused mission. You see, Southwest Airlines doesn't try and do a lot of good things. No, Southwest Airlines does a few great things. And this laser-focused mission has resulted in stunning results, hasn't it? In fact, the first time in May of 1988, Southwest Airlines won the coveted Triple Crown Award. What's that? That is an award given out every month by the national airline industry for the airline that has the best on-time record, the best baggage handling results, as well as the best customer satisfaction. In fact, since May of 1988, Southwest Airlines has won that coveted Triple Crown Award 30 more times. St. Michael Lutheran Church, we want to have a simple, laser-focused mission, right? We understand intuitively that, that any organization doesn't want to try and do a lot of good things. No, a successful organization wants to do a few excellent things. So that's why we're rolling out this strategic plan this month and a little bit into the month of October. Like Southwest Airlines, we want to see our church, if you will, <laughs> going down the runway, all right, getting ready to take off. That's the goal. Uh, that's why we are using Paul's letter to the church in Rome to interface and connect our strategic plan with what God's Word has to say. So you may remember, if you were in church last week, we began rolling out the strategic plan looking at our church mandate. Mandate. There are five parts to this sermon series. They all begin with the letter M. <laughs> so we began last week with our mandate. A mandate in any organization, or for our purposes, a church, asks this question, what will our church do? Kind of a basic organizational idea. Oh, well, what do we do? Why are we here? What's up? We answered that mandate question with this answer last week, right? Our mandate comes from Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2. And from Romans 12, 1 and 2, we found that God calls us to make a great commitment. Remember that? A living sacrifice. A great commitment to the great commandment of love and the great commission to make disciples of all nations so that we more and more become a great church. So someone asked you, what does your church do? Hopefully you might recall Romans 12, 1 and 2. That's our mandate. Those are our marching orders. Today we ask, what are our motives? Oh, what gets us stirred up? What excites us? What do we value? See, if a mandate asks, what will our church do? Our motives ask, how will our church do it? And our strategic plan answers that question with a fourfold plan. The first of our motives, our, our values, what we... Endeavor to be, right here at St. Michael, would be this. We want to be a church more and more that is motivated by having Christ at the center. Uh, that's it, a Christ-centered church. Now, Paul, before he gets into anything in Romans... He makes sure that this church in Rome has Christ right. Paul understands that if a church doesn't understand Christ correctly, that church won't get anything correct. So after his obligatory introduction in the first two verses in Romans, Paul talks about Jesus. This is what he says. 
regarding his son, who as to his human nature was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Beautiful words, aren't they? Compelling words. An awesome description of who this Christ is. And the first thing that Paul says is that Jesus has a human nature. He was a descendant of David. Right? We understand this. Jesus is a real person and real flesh and blood. He was really born. He walked. He ate. He cried. He bled. He sweat. He died. Jesus is really like us, uh, apart from sin. Christ is fully human, not in some abstract sense, but he does that for you. Are you lonely, afraid, discouraged, feeling abandoned, forsaken, empty, depressed, in the dark? Do you know what it feels like to face death head on? Jesus is fully human for you. He understands that completely. Jesus is not only fully human for us, so he can relate with us and we can talk to him and say, Lord, you know what that feels like? And he says, you bet I do. Paul goes on to say Jesus is fully God. That's the other highlighted word here. At the end of verse 4 in Romans 3 and (laughs) 4 in chapter 1, Paul says, Jesus Christ our Lord. Anytime the New Testament calls Jesus Lord, the New Testament is making a stunning and startling claim over the identity of Jesus. Paul and other New Testament writers, when they call Jesus Christ Lord, are making the stunning claim that this Jesus, really human, this Jesus is really God. That God who appeared to Moses in the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, and he said, I am who I am, that God is Jesus. He is that Lord. He is that God. And again, not in some kind of abstract way. Jesus is fully human for you. He is fully God for you. Jesus not only understands sweat and pain and frustration and abandonment, he has the capacity to do something about it. He can marshal all the power in the universe for one singular goal to take what is wrong in your life and make it right again. Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Yahweh, our God of the Old Testament, is now here in human form. That's why the New Testament has these lofty, breathtaking names for Jesus, right? He's Emmanuel, God with us. He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is the light of the world. He's the bread of life. He's the good shepherd. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He's the resurrection and the life. He's the cornerstone. He's the great high priest. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. He is the Lion of the tribe of Judah. He's the root and offspring of David. He's the bright morning star. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. Lords, all of that, Paul says, for you. So think of it this way. We are a Christ-centered movement. And this Christ we proclaim wore the thorns, and he sits on the throne. Thorns and throne, thorns and throne. True man, true God for us. Paul says, you don't get that right. (laughs) Forget it. You won't get anything right in church. This is what we value. 
highly. This Jesus is whom we adore. We are captivated by the one who wore the thorns and sits on the throne. There he is. Paul, for his part, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4, came along and said, I don't want to know anything in this church except Christ and Him crucified. That's it. That's it. We are a Christ-centered church. We are also discipleship-directed. Paul is teaching us, just as he taught the church in Rome, what it means to be a church, what to value, what excites us and motivates us. And not only are we Christ-centered, we are discipleship-directed. As we allow Romans to inform us, we go to chapter 15, verse 4. Paul talks about the Scriptures here, the Bible. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us. You might circle that word teach. A disciple is someone who is taught. A disciple is someone who hasn't arrived yet. A disciple is someone who doesn't have all the answers. We want to be a discipleship-driven church where people want to be taught. The Word of God, because Paul has some great promises connected with God's Word. He says that this Word, written to teach us, gives us endurance. Endurance. We all need endurance. Life gets tough. Very tough. (laughs) The Greek word for endurance there, I put it up there, hypomone. Beautiful word, captivating word. Hippo means under, mone means remain. The Bible helps me remain under God's Word. That's where the joy is. That's where life is. It's staying under God's Word. Well, I have this propensity to want to go around God's will. (laughs) I want to go over God's will. I want to go through God's will. But the Word helps me remain under God's will. Paul also says that whatever was written in the past to teach us gives us endurance, right? As I read and study and learn and memorize God's Word, I stay under God's will. I also what? Paul says, I'm encouraged. I'm encouraged to high endeavor. I want to be God's very best husband and father and pastor and citizen. I am what? Encouraged by the Bible. Another fascinating word he uses here in the Greek Paraklesaos. Paraklesaos. Sounds like paraclete, right? And Jesus says the Holy Spirit is the paraclete in John chapter 14, 15, and 16. A paraklesaos, a paraclete, is someone who stands beside you. Para means beside, like paramilitary. Klesaos means to call. The Bible is my constant companion. The Bible stands right next to me, beside me, and calls out words of life and hope and mercy and grace. That's why we want to be a discipleship-directed church. We want strong Christians who are what? Staying under the will of God and have encouragement and endurance. You've all probably played this game before, right? Shoots and ladders. Shoots and ladders. When my three children were much smaller, we would play shoots and ladders a whole lot. And you understand what the goal is, right? You want to land on the ladders, not the shoots. The ladders take you up. The shoots take you down. Well, one particular day, Abby, Jonathan, and Lori and I were playing chutes and ladders, and these kids decided they wanted to land on all the chutes, not the ladders. They were having so much fun sliding down the chutes. I said, come on, you have to be successful, and you want to be a winner in life. 
You need to hit the ladders, not the chutes. They didn't believe me a single bit. (laughs) It's a whole lot easier, a whole lot fun to take the chutes rather than the ladders, right? It's a whole lot easier in a church just to take the chutes, just slide by. I'm just sliding by. If we're going to be discipleship directed, it means work. It means commitment. It means engagement in this Word of God that gives us endurance and encouragement. So I'm asking a church, climb some ladders. Climb some ladders. That's it. Christ-centered. Discipleship directed. What else do we value in this church? This simple laser-focused plan. We want to be family-focused. Family-focused. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 4, verse 16, Abraham is the father of all who believe. Abraham is a father. A father implies a mother. And a mother and father imply, of course, children. The Bible is family-focused. The first book in the Bible is all about a family, right? Abraham and Sarah, and then there's Isaac and Rebekah, and then there's Jacob and Rachel. The Bible itself says you pass on the faith through the family. So what does that look like? It means that as parents, we, and I don't care how old our children are, (laughs) we're still their parents. They're still looking at us. Grandma and grandpa and great-grandma and great-grandma. We're always parents. Those children are looking not just that we see to it that they are introduced to Jesus. No, Going back to family focus slide, (laughs) those children are our responsibility to introduce to Jesus. See, it's not enough just to drop them off and let someone else do it. No, family focus means it's my job. And that makes us a little queasy, doesn't it? As parents, we tend to parent in areas that are our strengths, right? So if you have a macho, jocko dad who just has a little son born, what does that macho, jocko dad do on day one? If that little child is born in Fort Wayne, Indiana, that little kid gets a Colt jersey, a tin cap jersey, a Purdue jersey, a Notre Dame jersey, yes, even an IU jersey. And then, once that little kid is about three months old, the dad looks at that kid and says, what are you doing just laying around there? Get up and pump some iron. See, we parent in areas that we feel competent in. And the problem is, some people don't feel competent in spiritual, biblical things. So they pass those children off to the church. I can't think of a greater recipe for disaster. The church can't do it for you, parents and grandparents. The church can't do it for you, but the church will do it with you. That's the point. That's a family-focused church. Not doing it for the parents, but doing it alongside the parents. Because that's where faith is passed on. What's going to take off in this congregation? Christ-centered, discipleship-directed, family-focused. There's one more, one more motive, one more value, one more core piece to what we see happening here. And that would be a church that is mission-minded. Paul, again, instructs the church in Rome in chapter 15. I tell you that Christ Jesus has become a servant of the Jews to confirm the promises made to the patriarchs, that's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, 
so that the Gentiles may glorify God for His mercy. What's that mean? It means that even the Old Testament patriarchs were mission-minded. In fact, Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, in Abraham, all the families of the earth will be blessed. The Old Testament is massively missionally minded. The Old Testament is all about the outsider, not so much the insider. And Paul says, that's the goal of the church, to be thinking about the outsiders as well as the insiders. You may not recognize this man, but he is an Olympian gold medalist Uh, many times. His name is Matt Emans. Matt Emans is a specialist at the 50-meter rifle competition. In 2004 at the Olympic Games, Matt Emans was ready to win another gold medal in the 50-meter rifle competition. All he had to do on his last shot was hit the target anywhere. Just hit the target, and he's won, yes, another gold medal. So he stood, he aimed, he shot, he fired another bullseye. Bam! He did it! A few minutes later, the judges walked up and said something that just stunned Matt Emans. He scored a zero on that last shot. He missed everything. Eman says, no, I hit the bullseye. The judges said, no, no, no. You were standing in lane two, and you shot the target in lane three. That's called cross-firing. That means missing the target completely. Churches can do that. You know that. I know that. We think we're hitting the bullseye, but we're missing the complete target. And what's the target? Paul tells us the Gentiles, uh, the the unbelievers, uh, the outsiders. That's the target. Jesus puts it this way in Luke chapter 19, verse 10. The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost. Lost people are the target. Mission-minded. A couple weeks ago, I heard about some Roman Catholic nuns, kind of like these up here on the slides, And they were nurses. These nuns were nurses. And they were on their way to work one day when, wouldn't you know, they ran out of gas. But there was a gas station just a block away. But the problem was these nuns didn't have any gas container. But being the resourceful types, these nuns thought, Oh, as nurses, we have a bedpan in the trunk. So let's get the bedpan, take it to the gas station, fill up that bedpan with gas, take it back, and sure enough, we will have gas in the car. So that's what they did. And just as they were using that bedpan to fill up their car with gas, a couple guys drove by. They couldn't believe their eyes. Finally, one guy said to another, Fred, Fred, that's what I call faith. Oh, wow. Real faith, right? Real faith is what we need. This idea of being Christ-centered, discipleship-directed, family-focused, mission-minded. It all looks good on paper, but it takes faith, your faith, my faith, faith in the God who says, I will build my church. Faith in the Savior who says, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Faith that dares to utter three words, Three words as we look at this laser-focused 
strategic plan. And these three words come from Southwest Airlines. You know the drill. Turn off all your electronic devices. Fasten your seatbelt. Store all of your carry-on luggage under your seat. And then the three words. (laughs) The three words that God calls us to embrace. By great faith. You ready for these words? Here they go. Let's (laughs) take off. Amen.